A lot of people got a lot of desires for you, but in his presence, that's really where I want to be. And see, you ain't always got to be it, but at least you need to want to be there. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I just want to be in the right place. And how many know God will bless you for your want to? That's where I want to be. Come on, you sing to him. Tell him, that's where I want to be. Wherever you are. Wherever you go. Whatever you're doing in this season, that's where I want. If you're here, Lord, if you're over there, Jesus. Whatever you're doing in this season, don't do it without me. Open your mouth and tell him that's where I'm. Hallelujah. Come on and clap your hands and give God a great praise. What an awesome God we serve. Anybody glad to be in his presence? Well, if you're glad to be in his presence, act like it and just give God the best hand clap of praise you can give him. I want you to clap till your skin turn pink. book of Jonah chapter 3 can you thank God for our praise team for ushering us into the presence of God today in the book of Jonah chapter number Three. Verse 1 and 2 declares, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Let the church say second time. Yes. Saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Then when we go to verse 10, God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not. For the past several weeks, we've been talking about the overlooked. And I know that Jonah is not an overlooked character in scripture, but there are certain aspects of his life, his existential plight, that we have a tendency and proclivity to totally ignore for some reason or another after he exits the mouth of the great fish 
we stop reading his story. And so today I want to go beyond the whale, to go beyond the ship, to go beyond the overthrowing of a passenger into the aftermath. And it's critical that we go into the aftermath because I hasten to say, as redundant as it may seem, that most people only desire to remember you how they met you. Here you are 40 and people stopped you at 25 overlooking the fact that 15 years have passed and a lot has changed since the last time they saw you. And if not much has changed since the last time they saw you, tell your neighbor you got some catching up to do. will kill me in a condescending manner to say you've changed when the concept is to change. So change is normal. Change is necessary. And it is more necessary for some than others because I think all of us would agree that we know some people that you've been praying God if you don't do nothing else for them change them in Jesus name <laughs> there are two reasons why people change one is that they have learned enough so now they want to change. And two, they have been hurt so much until they realize it's time to change. And so whatever your reason is, you got a good reason. Grandmama said it best when you know better. Y'all knew my grandmama. then when you've been hurt so much you should get to a place in your life where you realize you need to change and if you are not careful you can have the proclivity to engulf and embrace your existence gelling together becoming solidified and concretized in relationships that become adversarial to your tomorrow which is why I have to continuously remind us don't, don't ever be content with the person's present I'm not content with your present you should not be content with my present because the moment we become contented with the present, you become adversarial to the future. And there are some places in all of our lives where we are that we don't want to be there forever. And the last thing you need is for somebody to be happy with your unpleasant state of being. Because the moment you do get a job, they're angry because you don't need them anymore. And so I think that as I sort of backdoor the text of Jonah's life, I don't want us to just become comfortable with reading chapters one and two because that's where the fun is. That's where the action is. We see a runaway preacher on the run from God whom the text literally declares in chapter 1 that Jonah decides to flee not merely from the assignment of God but from the presence of God. It's interesting that 
the praise team just sang into the holy of holy. That's where I want to be. We worship you in the spirit. We worship you in the truth. It's your presence. That's where I want to be only to find a preacher who has a desire to flee from the presence of God. I think that to even have that mindset, you, you are not only criminal, but you're also crazy because there is no place that you have ever been where you have been outside of the scope or the presence of God. And I think that when we think on that level, when we think deeper than status quo and norm, uh, you, you will discover now the necessity that is laid upon us to live in such a way that I ain't got to be at the church to do right. Because some people only are as holy as the atmosphere. <laughs> Preach, Pastor White, I'm in the house. We, 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 we remember Sunday to keep it holy. But the other six days since I ain't at church, I ain't got to be holy. But tell your neighbor, our God is a 24-7 God. He, uh, that means he saw you at work and he saw you at the club and he saw you in the room and he saw you in the corner and he saw you with the joint in your mouth. He saw you with the bottle in your hand. He saw you with the boot on your arm. Say amen when I get to you. He he saw you cussing. He saw you fussing. He saw you laying. He saw you playing. He saw you trying, and he saw you crying. He, he saw you praying, but he saw you paying. He saw you staying. He saw us doing everything that we did because uh, there is the presence of God that exceeds beyond the limitation of where we currently are. And it is Jonah who has the desire to flee that presence only to find out that when he left from his home to go to Joppa, God was in Joppa. When he left from Joppa to enter into the ship, God was on the ship. And when he got out on the sea, he discovered that God was on the sea. And then when he was thrown overboard into the sea, he found out that God could swim. He was also under the water. You see, I think the body of Christ needs to understand that there is no place that you could hide from God because he created the hiding spaces. And if he created the hiding spaces, David said, behold, even if I make my bed in hell, you are already there. Tell your neighbor, you can't hide from God. I, I don't care where you go. You can go to your mama in them house. Don't act like God don't know your mama address. You, you can go anywhere you please that you think that a lot of people don't come and God is right there. I think this is the dilemma in the church realm, our subculture, that we only do good as long as we know that people might see us. But the issue is not whether or not people see you because people ain't got a heaven or a hell to put you in. If you got the fear of being seen by anybody, God holds your eyes. Because if you see me in certain places, you might not be pleased with the content of my demographic. But Jonah didn't understand. Jonah thought that God was soft because he was nice. He thought that God would not come after him. But might I suggest to you that in as much as we chase after God, as the deer panteth after the water brook, the same God whom we chase will chase you. 
let's just keep it 100. The only reason you at church today is because God, he had to literally walk you down. He, he had to come up from behind. He had to hawk you down. He, he had to chase you until the day finally came where your hands were lifted up and your heart was ready to receive a blessing from him. You see, you want to sit here and act like you ain't never ran from God before. But it's about 40 of y'all in this room that can keep it 100 with you, Pastor, and say, Pastor, it took like God having to perform a cataclysmic move, a catastrophic move just to get somebody like me to drive as far as I had to drive all the way over here to Hoover and declare this is the day that the Lord has made. Some of y'all can't say amen with us because you've been holy forever. But the 12 of you that know God had to chase you, God was literally out of breath by the time he caught up with you because we weren't trying to do anything that God told us to do. But the reason I had to shout in chapter 3 is because verse 1 declares that the word of the Lord came unto Jonah a second time. You ought to high five your neighbor and shout a second time. Okay, I see some of y'all don't know when to shout. You see, he didn't have to speak to you again after he spoke to you the first time. Some of y'all getting mad at God because you waiting on God to give you a new word and you still ain't obeyed the last word. But if he looked beyond your fault and spoke to you again, I feel like shouting all around the embassy. If he spoke to you again, that's reason enough to give God praise for the rest of your days. I know some of us in this room want to pretend like we ain't never done anything outside of the will of God. But it's a few of us in this room that deserve for God never to speak to us again. If God turned the cold shoulder to us, he would be well within his right because God then told us to do about 12 or 13 things and we still haven't done even the first one. Don't look at your neighbor, just look at me. It's still some stuff on your things to do list that you still haven't scratched off the list yet and, and you're waiting on God to bless you, waiting on God to take you to the top. Could it be possible that the reason that God hadn't taken you to the top is because you can't even handle bottom level issues yet. You, you can't handle kindergarten demons. What make you think you're getting ready to graduate and matriculate to the next season of your life? But the beautiful thing is that God speaks to him a second time, which is the overlook aspect of Jonah's life because we stopped reading after chapter 2. After Jonah enters the belly of the great fish and for three days and three nights he's in the belly of the fish I say he was in Whale University because it was there that God was teaching him and training him and pruning him and humbling him you see you ain't ready for your next season until God takes you through a period of isolation some of you are in a season of isolation and you feel like God has forgotten about you. The proof that God has not forgotten about you is that he places you by yourself. The fact that God has given you the space and opportunity to learn of him without distractions and interruptions is the proof that God is preparing you and pruning you for the public. You see, if you can't handle private, you definitely can't deal with publicly because God always works from the inside out and not the outside in. You see, it's like having a car and you got it waxed and you got it washed. You got a paint job. You got tint. You got rims. But the engine is all messed up and the battery don't even work. So you got TVs in a car that won't come on because the car won't even crank up. Not here at FCC, but at your cousin them church, I keep praying for them because they're polished and clean and deodorized and sanitized on the outside, but there's something 
missing on the inside and, and you thought your looks and your pokertude and your beauty and your fineness was going to do it. But who in here can be honest and admit that as fine as you are is some things fine don't do for you. And some things a degree won't do for you. And some things your lips, hips, and fingertips won't do for you. You got to get in with God. I just got to say it like it is. We got to get closer to God. If you talking about trying to get closer to your husband or your wife, God is saying until you do right by me, everything you think about going for, can I get a purple color purple anointing in this room today that God is saying until you line up this way, everything you trying to do this way ain't going to work out for you. That's why some of y'all got four jobs and you still broke because God says until you line up this way, everything you trying to do on this level ain't going to work. God can give you a good man and a good woman, but if you don't get right by him, you ain't going to do right by them. And you're going to let a good thing slip right. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. He has to take him through a season of isolation. And after three days and three nights, the Bible declares in chapter 2 of Jonah that the fish vomited out Jonah. Without being too graphic, excuse me, respectfully, he threw up Jonah. He threw up. Out Jonah. Now, what does it mean to vomit? What happens when a person vomits? What literally happens on the inside is that something that has entered into you does not agree with your system. And because it does not agree with your system, your system has to release that which is not in agreement with the inside. Now, do you see why some of your friends don't like you anymore? Now, do you understand why you ain't got but one friend and two cousins left when you used to have a panel of people around you is because some stuff that you were dealing with, it didn't agree with your system no more. Now they saying you think you better than everybody else. Boo boo, I ain't trying to be better than nobody but the me I used to be. I'm trying to be a better Tadera today than I was on yesterday. I ain't competing against nobody but me. I want to be better tomorrow than I am today. There's some things that no longer agree with your system. That drug habit, it no longer agrees with your system. Land and plan, it no longer agrees with your system. Foolishness, that ghetto mentality, it no longer agrees with your system. Look at somebody and tell them, I'm sophisticated now. I'm sorry, man. I, 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 I can't do the dirty foot and pigeon toe. You know, I, I can't do that crackhead stuff no more. I, that get over spirit, see, that's a spirit right there. You're trying to run a line from your house to your neighbor's house and here you are God done blessed you you making fifty sixty thousand dollars a year but you still got that get over spirit you still got that hand me something spirit you know waiting on everybody to bless you but you'll never bless nobody that's a spirit that needs not to agree with your system and the bible says God allow for the fish to throw out Jonah. And when the fish throws out Jonah, chapter 3, verse 1, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah a second time. And in verse number 2, God says to him, what I want you to do is I want you to go and preach, check this, the preaching that I bid unto thee. Uh, don't read your Bible too fast. If you read your Bible too fast, you're going to miss more than you catch. Verse 2, he says, preach unto them that great city. God said it the second time just like he said it the first time. He says, preach unto them the preaching that I bid unto thee. Now, this is the grace and the mercy and the favor of God. This is not the rule, but it is the exception to the rule, which is why it is a crazy thing to play with God. It's, it's a very dangerous uh, position in which to find yourself when you find yourself playing with God, just, just knowing he's going to give you another chance, just, just knowing you'll get this time again, just knowing that this harvest will not pass. It will come 
around again. He speaks to him a second time and says, preach unto them the preaching that I bid unto thee to preach. Can I say something for just a moment in passing about uh, second instructions? That's why what God really wants us to do is get to a place where he no longer has to repeat himself. Ain't nothing I hate worse. Y'all got to pray for you, Pastor. I got a lot of issues, and one of my issues is I don't like having to repeat myself. I don't like having to repeat instructions. I got too much on my mind. I got too much to do. It's like it's critical that when I say it the first time, don't ask me two and three times what I said. It, it irks my spirit. As a matter of fact, if you ask your boss at work, if you ask uh, your employer at work, you sit down and talk to them and say, well, what is one of the top things that peeves you or perturbs you or upsets you, well, they will undoubtedly suggest to you nine times out of ten that the one thing that I don't like is having to repeat an instruction. Why? Because whenever a person has to repeat an instruction, they've already lost money on you. They've already lost time on you. So it is the grace of God. It is the exception to the rule. It is not the rule because God never intended to have to say things twice. Okay, let me see if I can preach you where you can reach it since you're looking at me in that tone of voice. The reason some of us defined to be refined, the reason that some of us ain't got blessed in 2017 is because you're waiting on a word called confirmation. You're waiting on God to say it again, Lord. Just show me a sign. Show me confirmation. You don't need a sign when he's already said it preach Pastor White. I know I'm in the house today. Some of y'all waiting on God to say the same thing in the new that he said in the old. You, God, if you say it again, then I'll believe it. If he said it one time, it was already settled in heaven. You ain't got to treat God like you treat your friends that you really don't trust. You know, that they say they're going to do something. You look at them and say, mm-hmm, you know, promise, you know, cross your heart, you know, say you swear, put it on your mama grave, you know. We got to do it on somebody's grave before we believe something. But God is not a ghetto fabulous God. If he said it, he's faithful to perform it. That which he's spoken, I feel like preaching, he's faithful to perform. If the Lord said it, you can count on it. He will do just what he said he will do. He's a way maker, miracle worker. Here's my part, promise keeper. Look at somebody and tell him he's a promise keeper. He, he's a promise keeper. He's a faithful God. It is his grace grace that is exceptional to this moment to speak a second time and declare preach unto them the preaching that I bid thee to preach. You know one of the hardest things if I can just let you come into my world for just a moment I'll be honest with you one of the hardest things about being a pastor is is remaining fresh remaining fresh you know to be able to come week in and week out and preach a different message to some of the same faith is how do you make the same people say amen from week to week, you know, not running out of stuff, not running out of information. And the more frequent you preach, the more difficult it is to glean and gain new information. You know, when you preach sporadically, you got weeks and months to prepare. I mean, you can go to the library, you can go to Google, you can read Paul Tillich, you can read Matthew Henry, you can go to a Dake's illustration straight commentary. I mean, you got you got Dr. Wayne House and all of these different people that you can read and you can research. You got time for syntax and context and culture, theology, psychology, Christology, pneumatology, Greek and Hebrew word study, and you can put that thing together. If you think you heard me preach before, give me three months without preaching and then let me preach. Oh man, I, I had time to deal with some stuff and so it's difficult to come back to back and preach new stuff and fresh stuff unless of course you do verse 2 which is to preach the preaching that I bid unto thee. You see as long as you're trying to manufacture your own word it's always going to be difficult to put it together. But real preachers don't preach what you want to hear and real preachers don't preach what they want to preach. They do verse 2. They preach the preaching that I bid unto thee, which is why I need to say something to this timid generation 
generation of believers, don't get mad leaving the church after you hear a word from God like it's the preacher's fault because at the end of the day, it's God who prepares the meal. We just serve it. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to all of y'all. I'm talking to all of y'all. Ooh, I'm finna mess up somebody's spirit. I'm finna bust somebody's bubble. Pray for me. Bro Kelly, you might have to walk me to my car, but I'm praying for all of y'all who go into the restaurant and they get your food order wrong and you start cussing out the waiter. Look at your name and tell them waiters don't cook food. They just serve it to you. They just bring it to the table. If it ain't cooked like you want, this ain't right. This ain't done. It's cold. And they looking at you like, ma'am, I didn't prepare it. It's my job to pick it up and bring it to you. That's what we do as servants of God. We are carriers of the message. And so if you got a problem with the word, you got to go to the one who prepared the word and I dare you to say something to him because God better than anybody knows how to put church folk in their place. Can I get a what what from four people in here that know that God will get you straight through the washing of his word. He says preach the preaching that I bid unto thee. I know it had to be the word of God because Jonah in and of himself as, as, as prejudiced as he was, by the way we'll talk about that later as prejudiced as he was I know Jonah wanted to preach this in and of himself it had to be God who spoke this word for him to preach because when you read verses 3 and 4 what you would discover we didn't read it but go home and read it in your spare time it ain't but 10 verses in chapter 3 what you would discover is Jonah went to Nineveh Finally, he ultimately went to Nineveh, although he tried to uh, run from the assignment the first time, but he does go and finally do it, which is a beautiful thing in passing that uh, it took me a while, but I finally obeyed. I, I, I thought about calling that the title of this message, but the series is entitled The Overlook. But tell your neighbor, uh, it took me some time, but I finally obeyed. Just just tell him that. It, it took me some time, but 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 I finally obeyed. Don't, 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 don't laugh at me because I was a little slow. It took me some time, but I, I finally obeyed. Look at your neighbor telling me, at least I'm here, you know. It took me some time, but but I finally obeyed. I ain't been in church in about six months. It took me some time, but I finally obeyed. You see, that's why I like coming here versus going to your cousin them church because there's too many critical and judgmental people that when they ain't seen you for sick, child, where you been? What you been up to? It ain't none of your doggone business where they been. You just need to be glad that today they're in the y'all ain't talking back to me. They are in the service one more time. Maybe it took them a little longer to come around than it took you, but you at least need to be glad that Punkin and Queen Queen them finally made it in. You wanted them to come around by the time they were 15, but they 32 now. Be thankful to God that he spared their life long enough so that he wouldn't let them be a fool forever. Who am I preaching to? In the, it took me some time, but I finally obeyed. Oh, I feel God in the room today. I feel a spirit of gratitude in this room that God didn't let you die while you were out in the streets. He didn't let you die while you were doing your thing. It took me some time, but I finally got things together. And I really ain't where I need to be but I'm praising God that at least I ain't where I, I used to be man if, if you think I'm crazy today you should have known me in 2004 2004 me wasn't nothing nice but 2017 I'm a little better than I used to be you know some of y'all you still go to the club but you used to be in there every weekend 52 weekends at the year you was in there shaking it fast and dropping it like it was was hot and backing it up like a U-Haul truck and all that, but now it ain't 52 weeks, you down to 40 weeks. You ain't where you need to be, but at least you are headed in the right direction. It took me some time, but I finally got it together. Check it. I knew it had to be God giving him the word, because when he preaches the word, here's what he says to him. Short sermon. Short sermon. You ain't got to have a long sermon to be powerful. Short sermon. Here's what he said. In 40 days, God going to destroy this place. 
Let us all stand. Now may the Lord watch between me and thee while we have some one from another. Peace. That's what he preached. That was the son. He didn't take no text. He didn't say, let us go to the book of and let us read a few verses. And would you read it with me and let us stand for the reading of the Holy Writ. He says, look, I really don't want to be here, but I'm just being obedient to God. Let me tell y'all this. In 40 days, God going to kill every one of y'all. Bye. Bye. Now, now, here's what leads me to say this. Here what leads me to say this, BJ. This, this, this is critical. This, this is what I found out. Ain't nothing more dangerous, Miss Gladys. I, I promise you. And, and I, I want to say this to everybody that's trying to trying to run up and be a preacher in 2017. It, it might it might have been cool and fly in the 90s, but in 2017, ain't nothing more dangerous than being a preacher. I I, I take that to my grave. I'm telling. You, I, I would rather take the scrutiny of being the president of the United States because ain't nothing. I'm telling you, ain't no more pressure in this timid, sensitive generation than being a preacher. I'm telling you, you will be surprised at how many people will leave wonderful ministries, wonderful churches over one sermon that they didn't like. I mean, they got their toes stepped on one time and all of a sudden, they man, look, I wouldn't even go to a church that the preacher don't step on my toes every now and then when I know I ain't all the way right, when I know I ain't perfect, when I know I got some growing up and some maturing that I need to do. I mean, all I'm saying, if the shoe fits, just wear it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, ju just wear your shoe until you can you know, find your golden slipper, Cinderella, you understand? I mean, just, just, just go on and go through it. But, but this brother preached a message of destruction. Here's where most people would have said, you are a preacher, ain't you? S since you are a preacher, you a man of God, you shouldn't be preaching that kind of stuff. You should be preaching a message of hope. You, you, you do know at your cousin them church, all they want to do is go and shout. I'm going to get my praise on. I'm going to go get my shout on today, baby. I'm going to go get my shout and my dance on and call it a day. And you don't even know that God ain't calling you to shout. He causing you to change. Yeah. Preach, Pastor White. I'm in here, man. Doing the best. Y'all ain't giving your boy the love he deserved for this. <laughs> He ain't calling you. He ain't calling you to leave with a smile on your face. He is calling you to leave with conviction in your mind, in your heart, and in your spirit. Thank you. He is calling you to another level of responsibility. He says in 40 days, I'm going to destroy this place. And it doesn't matter how, how timid or how sensitive you are. The truth is the truth whether you like it or receive it or not. But do you know why I like Nineveh? There's something about Nineveh that I like. I know it's a great city. I know it was a large city. It took three days to see it. And I know there was a lot of sin in Nineveh. I get that. I mean, they were doing everything under the sun, you know, sort of like America. <laughs> we'll talk about that later, you know, just Everything was right. You know, if it's common, it's right. If everybody's doing it, then it's right. You know, if the majority agree with it, then it's right. Usually the majority is wrong. In God's eyes, you know, usually the majority is wrong. God is always in the minority in terms of likes, but he's always in the majority because he's the CEO of the universe. And at the end of the day, you know, you can vote against him all you want to. He still wins. I wish I had some real Holy Ghost feel people in the room now. And so he says, preach the preaching that I would have you to preach unto them. And he says, in 40 days, God is going to destroy this place. And to my surprise, says, what I like about Nineveh, they ain't like your cousin, them church that will leave with an attitude. Tell my baby, I ain't never going back to that church no more. And I don't like that kind of preaching. You know, I mean, it just seemed like to me, if you're a man of God, you're a man of faith, then you should have something better to say than that. I mean, it looked like to me you would encourage me instead of condemning me. It looked like you would encourage me a little bit better. You see some of y'all quiet because all you want is encouragement. That's your crutch. That's your crutch. That's your crutch. Give me some encouragement. That, that's all I want. Just give me a word to encourage me. But God is not in the business of making you happy. God is in the business of making you holy. And sometimes what we need is not encouragement. We need somebody to get in our grill and say, look, get your tail up off that sofa. The reason you broke is because you lazy. That's why you ain't never gotten Y'all ain't talking to me in this house. He says, 
preach the preaching that I bid unto thee. And the word of God was in 40 days, I'm going to burn this place down. And when they heard it, I like Nineveh, this is what they did. As soon as they heard that sermon, instead of saying, kick that preacher out of here, we don't like that kind of preacher, they said, y'all know we need to do better. Y'all ain't talking. <laughs> watch this, watch this. Here's why they really should have been rejoicing. They should have felt this way because at least God gave them a deadline. He gave them a warning before destruction. You see, sometimes bad news is really good news because at least God is preparing you to brace yourself for the next season that you're getting ready to go through. That's why David said, I'm cool with walking through the valley of the shadow of death as long as I know that you're with me. You see, I'd rather have bad times with you than good times all by myself because good times by myself is not worthy to be compared to the bad seasons that I'm going through with you and some of y'all right now I, I need to tell you this might be your season to go through this might be your season to endure some pain it might not be your season for increase and prosperity this might be your sowing season but God sent me here to tell you don't worry about your sowing season because as soon as sowing season is over reaping season is getting ready to come God's got something in store for you but you got to go through it to get to it. Who am I preaching to in this room? You see, if you sow in tears, you will reap in joy because he turns your mourning into dancing. And if all you had was dancing, you would get tired. At some point, God got to sit you down and let you go through something. So when he blesses you again, you will praise him like you ain't never praised him before. Some of y'all are too used to being blessed. That's why you come to church and don't say amen. But when he take you through a dry season and bring you out, man, you are kick over chairs and flip over tables. You'll be running all down the hall. Folk at the embassy wondering what's wrong with you. If anybody asks you what's the matter with me, you'll tell them if it had not been for the Lord on my side. Ah, where would I? Uh, calm down, boy. Are you going in the circuit overload too fast? Check this. I'm done. He preaches the preaching that he bids and the people decide we can't do this no more. And check it. I dare you to read it. I dare you to read it. What you're going to find out, Steph, when you read it is that the king of Nineveh, unjust king, unjust people, everybody doing what makes them feel good. But this king did something that spiritual folk don't do. Don't do. He called not only for prayer, one by prayer. He called for a fast over the whole land. Why did? You better be careful pointing your finger at folk that don't go to church like you. Just because they don't go to church like you don't mean they don't know this word. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. As a matter of fact, sometimes it takes folk off the streets to, fo to show folk in the seats how to really get a prayer through and how to really get a prayer. Because, see, when they come in here, they coming in for real. Some of us come out of habit. But if something touch them in the streets to make them come in this place, you know it had to be a real encounter. With God. When you get knock knock and little pistol starter to say, I ain't finna do this life no more, it it had to be God moving on their behalf. It took an unjust king to say, listen, everybody gonna fast. We ain't putting this to no vote. We ain't having no panel discussion. We ain't having no conference meet. Everybody gonna fast. I dare you to read it. Not just everybody, but everything. The king said, if you got a dog, don't feed it. 
I know they want kibbles and bitch. You ain't giving nothing. No pedigree for little pup pup today. No. We we ain't giving no we ain't giving no treats. We not we not doing any of that today. If you got camels, you got horses, hey, we are not serving hay today. The devil is a lie. Ain't nobody gonna eat nothing. Because watch this. We are about to be destroyed, and the last thing we need is for one person to be out of order. Can, 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 I, can, I, can I tell you something in passing? I really didn't come to say this, but I love you too much not to tell you. That's why you got to be careful of the people in your crew. Because sometimes all it takes is one out of order person to throw off the whole rotation. Who am I preaching to in this room? Sometimes it just takes one person to throw off the whole entire rotation. I know it's a lot of people because verse 2, verse 3 rather says that Nineveh was so big it would take you three days just to view the whole city nonstop. So I know it was a big place and there were a lot of people, but he said everybody got to come into agreement. Can I tell you that? There's nothing that brings people together like tragedy. So when God sends tragedy in your life, he's really trying to bring organization to your life. He's trying to bring order into your life. Something is out of whack. So he has to allow for something tragic to happen to bring people together. Together. Now, we don't rejoice over tragedy, but you should rejoice over the results that come after the tragedy. Can I say this just by the way, just for instance, just for instance, uh, we, we hate recession. I hate recession. I hate famine. I hate lack. I, I can't stand lack. I, poverty is a curse. The Bible says nothing good about poverty ever in the scripture. So the, I hate poverty. I hate lack. I hate sickness. I hate illness but but do you know that more billionaires millionaires are made during recessions than any other time in the history of the economy because somebody's loss is somebody else's gain there is fortune there so we should still re rejoice as a result of the results that come after tragedy and so it is that God has to allow tragedy to come for everybody to get on board because if they didn't hear word that they would be killed in 40 days, nobody would have ever come together. But the fact that they heard tragedy was on the way, mama and daddy stopped arguing about what they was crying about at the house and they came together. Brothers and sisters stopped fighting each other because they understood that when the enemy is getting ready to come in, the last thing we need to do is fight each other. Help me preach. And so everybody fasted and everybody prayed and everybody rejoiced and everybody turned their faces to God. I got to raise up, but watch verse number 10. If you haven't torn it out of your Bible, it says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did not do it. It's praise time because God had it on their mind to destroy everybody. But when he saw that they turned their faces toward him and said, God, please give us one more chance. God, if you could do anything, please be gracious and merciful unto us. And God looked down and with eyes of mercy, he, he decided not to do what he said he was going to do. Okay, can I keep it 100 with you? The only reason you're sitting here looking at me right now is because God changed his mind. He changed his mind. Oh, God, it was some stuff that was waiting for you in the arena of our disobedience, but God said, I'm going to change my mind. Let's keep it 100. We done done enough wrong in our life, all of us, for us to be dead right now. Some of y'all ran the streets long enough to be hit by a straight bullet, but the only reason you're here is because God changed his mind. You remember that time you was in the club and they got the shooting and you was running, but you checked yourself and there wasn't no hole in you? The only reason you still here is because God changed his mind. Somebody in here, you done slept with enough folks to have AIDS, herpes, everything that you can name, even the new stuff that y'all didn't even know was out yet. But the only reason you still got a clean bill of health is because God changed. See how quiet they getting in the house? But you really need to be rejoicing because you escaped death. 
High five your neighbor and tell him I cheated death. I should have been dead a long time ago. I should have been dead while I was in high school. I can count three times my life flashed right before my eyes. But right in the nick of time, God reached in and snatched me out of it. When the enemy was coming in like a flood, the Spirit of God lifted up a standard and reminded the devil that no weapon that was formed against me was going to be able to prosper. You ought to high five three people and tell them I escaped. Uh, the devil thought he had me, but I got away from it because God literally changed his mind. God changed his mind, but by the time we got to chapter 4, Jonah decided to get mad with God because Jonah really didn't want God to do with Nineveh what he did with them because Jonah said, listen, I, I got a problem with this God because you told me that in 40 days you were going to kill everybody, but here you are being gracious and merciful to them. If you ain't going to let, watch this, if you're not going to let my words come to pass, then don't have me saying that you're going to kill them in 40 days only for you to turn around and not do what it is that you said. Jonah said, listen, I'm used to stuff that I'm saying coming to pass and this time you're going to reverse your word, but God had to help him to understand the same grace that I just gave to you when we overthrew you from that ship is the same grace that you need to be given to somebody. I'm through preaching when I tell y'all this. The reason the church is getting a bad reputation right now is because it's a whole lot of people that forgot that somewhere along the line God had to be gracious to you and so because you forgot that you needed mercy now you lack in giving mercy to other people but keep it 100 if God had to wait on you give him some time to wait on your nieces and nephews if God had to be patient with you give God time to be patient with somebody else comfort ye one another with the grace we're in, you have been comforted. That means when you have tasted to see how good God is, you'll start sharing him with everybody else that you come in contact with. You ought to lean on your neighbor and tell him, I'm not a hater of your blessings. I'm not envious of your blessings. I'm not jealous of you. The same God that's been good to me is the same God that I want to be good to you. When God bless my life, I expect God to bless your life. As a matter of fact, when God bless your neighbor, it just means that God is in your neighborhood. And if you can hold your peace and let God fight your battles, tell your neighbor he's coming to your house. Yeah, as soon as he finished blessing one person, he's going to stop by and bless you too. This same God that while Jonah sat across the street waiting to see if Nineveh was going to be destroyed, God planted a tree to cover Jonah's head because it was so hot outside. So he watched to see what was going to happen to Nineveh. But the very next morning, God sent the worm to kill the very tree that he planted over his head to keep him from the shade. Now that the tree is dead, he no longer has the shade. Jonah turns to God and say, God, why would you take that tree away from me? It provided shade from me out here in this hot, uh, boistering sun atmosphere. And God asked Jonah a very important question. Did you plant the tree? Did you sow for the tree? He says, are you mad that I took the tree away from you? He says, yes, I'm mad that you took the tree away from me. And God said, Jonah, did you plant the tree? Did you pray for the tree? Did you even ask for the tree? Jonah said, well, I guess not. God said, then I got the right to take it away from you. He said, watch this, the same way that you are mad and upset that I took this tree away from you and you didn't even deserve to have it. How much more should I look beyond the faults of other people who don't deserve my goodness and my mercy? I'm through preaching when I tell you this, but do you know when the kingdom of God is really going to come to the earth? It's when all of us understand that we are all in privileged positions. There should be no spirit of entitlement when it comes to anybody. I don't care what your title is. I don't care what you do. Everything you do, you do it by grace. Some of y'all complaining about your job and you have forgotten you didn't even qualify for it. 
All the days you were late, you should have been fired a long time ago. But the reason they keep letting you clock in is because he keep looking beyond your faults. And the same God that gave grace to Jonah is the same God that will give grace to you. And the same God that give grace to you is the same God that will give grace to your enemy. And so God says, I had to do this for them just to show you that they are no different from you, Jay. No different from you, bruh. If I gave you a word a second time, if they turn to me, I give them another chance. It is the goodness and grace of God that we miss and overlook in Jonah because we're too busy looking at the fish. And we're missing the real principle that sometimes God has to take us through shift, changes, paradigms, down seasons, broke seasons, weak seasons, sick seasons, hollow seasons, shallow seasons, wide seasons, narrow seasons. Loose seasons and tight seasons that we finally come to grips with the reality that God, I can forever remain humbled now. Because I ain't here because I'm the best preacher. I ain't here because I'm a good preacher. I'm here because I'm a graced preacher. Grandmama and them said back in the day, it's by the grace of God. We've come a long way. And when that is our spirit and that is our attitude, that's when God opens up your opportunities to reach everybody you come in contact with. Because you understand that you are that same person. The difference between you and them is the season you're in right now. That's what I don't want us to overlook. I told this to God. said to, to the Holy Spirit I said God I'm at a place now where you can trust me to bless me you can trust me to be good to me you can trust me with a healing you can trust me with a deliverance you can trust me with a breakthrough you, you can trust me with opportunity God you can trust me with financial blessing you you can trust me to bless me in any way because if anybody ever asked me how I got it they gonna know it was nobody but you that did this for me let's pray father I thank you in this moment for that which we've overlooked we see today none of us are where we are by necessity only through the pleasures of your grace. Thank you for it. We can brag not on ourselves. We can't pat ourselves on the back. Every blessing we got, you pat yourself on the back because you've done it again. I give you thanks and praise for every person in this room who has the right mindset, the right mentality about where they we don't look down on people because many of us really understand that they are only who we used to be. And if you did it for us, <laughs> we know you can do it for anybody. I thank you today for our unsaved friends and unsaved relatives that will become saved. Knowing God that you are no respecter of persons for the members that are on the way, for the harvest that is on the way, for the people whose hearts you're touching right now when they go home and think and contemplate, if this is the choice that I need to make, thank you, God, for piercing their hearts. And when they get here, we won't ask them where they've been. We'll just tell them we're glad you're here. What a great God you are. We bless you today and we give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, everybody say it. Amen. Come on, clap your hands and give God praise for his word today. What a great God we serve. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest.
the highest. Amen. It's giving time now. We want to prepare our hearts for giving. Yeah, go on, clap two times if that word bless you. Go on, give them a double dose of praise. Huh?